I really am excited about this talk. So the theme is language. Um, like I said before, we have uh, over 130 um, chapters, uh, Creative Mornings chapters worldwide. And what I've read is that there's over 40 spoken languages amongst us, among us. Um, and the uh, thing about language is that it's all a part of communication, right? So um, it's the way we communicate and there's a spoken and unspoken language to the way that we communicate with one another. Um, so why not have someone that knows about language that, you know, is an author of a book called P is for Pussy, right? It's, it just makes sense, right? Um, pussy, I'm gonna, I got one. Okay, um, <laughs> it's true. Um, so um, it was so, I think, I don't know how we met, but um, Elisa is kind of, I call her, she doesn't know this, but I call her my fairy godmother. Um, one, because she has like the awesome like storm hair going on, the little, she has a little gray right here. If you haven't seen it, I don't know how you've missed it. But, um, and, but every time I connect with her, she is, the way she communicates with me with not only the way she talks, but her body language is so warm and so welcoming and so honest and so real. Um, it's amazing the stuff that she's done um, as a creative. She's a producer, an artist, a, a lecturer, a curator. Um, she is a partner in an award-winning film studio called Teaneg. Um, she uh, comes here from Brooklyn, but she's based here in Baltimore, and I'm so excited that she's here to really um, share with us all of her wisdom and love um, about what she does, and um, yeah, and uh, just, She's awesome. She's just really awesome. Um, so um, without further ado, um, please give up for Lisa. But if you have any questions for her, because we're going to go through it quick, please tweet. Tweet at Baltimore underscore CM. It's right under there. Um, we're going to go um, to our Twitter for questions so we can get through this real quick. Um, but yeah, let us know. OK, Elisa. Does that mean? Okay. See this book, so this right here? Oh, I do. I don't know how to use it. The gray hair. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you guys for coming. I need to say, I don't know how much wisdom I can share. I, everybody in the audience, I know quite a few of you already, even though I'm a newbie, I'm only here for a year. but. The audience is filled with people that I sweat from afar and from close. So you guys will probably give me a lot more than I'm able to give you, but I'm thankful to Impact Hub and to Creative Mornings for thinking that I have enough to share with you. <laughs> I hope I can give you a little something, but um, otherwise, you know, we can have an exchange that makes more sense. Um, let's see. Okay, can you guys see beyond me? I'm also using cards, and <clears throat> also forgive me if my uh, voice, I'm having like some sort of sinus thing, so if I'm not loud enough, please just yell out, and, and I'll try to project, and if you're having any trouble seeing it, let me know. Um, so uh, Olivia said that she wanted to have me come and talk about language, and I guess that was to do with the fact that I wrote a book that sort of played with words and plays with language. Um, what she probably doesn't know is that I am obsessed with words. I really, really love um, the idea of language, both nonverbal and verbal, and, um, and you know, exploring ideas around words. So I'm excited to talk about it. Um, and so the first slide talks about every cultural phenomenon may be, a, may be studied as communication. And, you know, that really speaks to this idea that, um, for me, words and language and lexicons are things that sort of are the impetus for creating new communities and new kinds of um, you know tribes and and sort of ways of being together um, when I was in second grade maybe first or second grade at a birthday party and um, and a bunch of kids and in the olden times birthday parties meant you played records or whatever <laughs> And my language in particular was oral. I was very focused on music because we didn't have television. 
Um, my father was on the radio, so we had like 10,000 records and books in our house. So, you know, that's the place I dwelled, and um, that's how I shared <coughs> language with, with my friends or people that came over. And, um, and I remember, I, you know, the, the sort of distribution channel of that time was the radio. Everybody just listened on the radio. There wasn't the internet. And, um, and I remember the, you know, the big hit was the song Fire. I don't know if everybody knows Fire by Ohio, please. I know somebody's going to sing it. Fire. OK. Anyway, I am not. And maybe, maybe I'll be able to sing in key with the cold, but otherwise not so much. Um, and so that, you know, so that was the popular tune. So when we broke out the record, all the kids were like, play fire, play fire. And I was like, OK, that's cool. But no, we got to play the B side. Because again, this is you know how I communicated, and people were like, "No, no, no, play fire! That's the big record. That's what they're playing on the radio." And I was like, "Yeah, but, but the B side's better, and there's like two really good songs." Anyway, long story short, I had a tantrum and went to my room for most of the party, <laughs> much to my mother's extreme embarrassment. And she came in my room and said, "You know, what are you doing? You have your friends over. This is ridiculous." And for me, it was such a big deal that they sort of like rebuked my opportunity to share my language with them, right? And that, um, and then I also felt this like loss of affinity, like they're not B-side people too, who, who, who do I, who are these people? <laughs> these seven year olds that listen to the radio. Um, but that was, you know, a big moment for me in sort of like, you know, identity formation and understanding like who I was as a person that I was kind of a crate digger and I was interested in, in the obscure, I was interested in the other side and, um, and so began sort of like my general interest. And, and for me, I, I, I wanted to understand what it was that, made, that distinguished me and also connected me to my global tribe, my local tribe, even the folks in my house. And so um, one big thing, I guess if I had to identify something, for me, growing up, we're, we're originally from New York and we moved to D.C. My father went to Howard and D.C. at that time used to be nicknamed the Chocolate City. And so the black aesthetics of D.C., both um, you know, visually and, and orally, were, were really influential in the 70s for me. And so you know, I guess if I had to go back, I'd go way back, 400 years before, um, where my, my ancestors were brought here um, against their will and kind of created um, a new culture and a new language across many languages, as everybody here, I'm sure, understands the history of um, enslaved Africans in, in America. And we had to go, we had to communicate across not just countries, because we came from different countries, but tribes and, um, you know, even within tribes, class and things like that. So language became you know, obviously critical. And, it, and, and on two levels, it was critical for practical purposes. You know, you needed to be able to communicate to each other. You needed to be able to code that communication for safety. And you also needed to be able to talk to each other, to be in love and to take care of each other or fight or whatever you need to do. Um, and what's interesting to me, and you know, I am not a linguist, I'm not a historian. This is all my sort of ideas around language, but um, to me, when I think about you know, that and I think about the trajectory of black people in America, um, what we've done with language has been something that is necessarily inextricably bound to our place in, in the country. Um, and I think it's been a gift to American culture, to our culture, and it is, it's multifaceted. So what I have up here is um, a fugitive slave poster. This is a poster that a slave master would have put up and said, you know, someone's escaped or run away and I need to find them. And this is taken from, I think, Shane White's book. If you guys haven't ever seen it, it's called Stylin', it's fantastic. He's, he is actually a historian and an anthropologist. And he talks about how he could get at culture through language, right? So, but not just literal words, also expression and expressivity. And ex black expressivity is so interesting to me um, because, again, our beginnings, we, we obviously had to use nonverbal language. Everybody uses more nonverbal language than they do verbal language. Um, but under that stress and in those conditions, um, we were developing 
a new language. So I love these posters because they tell a lot about the conditions, but they also talk about <clears throat> um, expressivity. So they'll say, I'm looking for this person, he has this on, he has that on, but they'll also say, he does this thing where he looks directly at you, which was rebellion, right? So that's, and they describe it as this very aggressive person because he looks right in your eyes. So you know that early form of rebellion. Or they would <coughs> list things like, she does this thing where her eyes go to the side and you see more white than the, than the pupils and blah, blah, blah. And it was a long description to say she was giving you the side eye, basically. <laughs> and, <coughs> and, and, also, and it goes on and on and it talks about things like, um, you know, people moving their neck in a certain way and you could tell that this person was more defiant or, um, and also clothing and, you know, peacocking, taking, uh, what I call, you know, remix culture, taking existing garments that were leftovers and repurposing and remixing them, but doing them with like patterns that obviously were reminiscent of things that they brought from home. And in the descriptions, they were saying it's crazy, they don't match, they have these outlandish colors and they do all of this stuff. And it's these very descriptive and sort of, in a way, unmitigated discussions about expressivity and, and um, so I find it fascinating, even though it was for a sinister purpose, that I, you know, got to sort of think about like what were we doing and how were we behaving. You know, there's no real documents that show us what those periods look like in a moving sense. We have images, but we don't know what how the side eye looked then if it was the same, um, or if people do, <clears throat> you know, what what uh, we do, which is like point with your lips. I don't know if that's a black thing or not, but instead of pointing with your fingers, we're always, we do this, right? <laughs> and, and that's, uh, you know, that's probably something that is about discretion, but also, you know, it may have derived from something even more um, necessary. So, um, so anyway, the idea that our bodies were marked from the beginning of our time here and that our expressivity was outlawed in every way peacocking, walking, certain, uh, dressing a certain way, loving each other in a certain way, um, marriage, um, any kind of like familial um, display, all of these things. But somehow, not only did we retain them, but we flourished in some ways over time um, without sort of like, you know, traditional supports. Um, and so um, <laughs> this is a quote from Mary Baraka, I'm working on a film now about growing up in alternative environments in the 60s and 70s. You can guess what my source material is. <laughs> and um, and the name of it is, the working title was Children of the Revolution, but I changed it to The Terribles. When I was young, I, I was really in tune also with the slang. My parents were very young, they had me, they were still in college. And I remember particularly guys saying to my father, oh man, that's a terrible hat oh, that's a terrible outfit. And it meant, like, that's a really fly outfit. And even, you know, as a young kid, I was like, why would he say terrible, like, of all things? And I, of course, grew to learn that a lot of things that we say are incongruent with the Western meaning. That's bad. That's dope. That's ill. That's sick. Like, all of those things are generally in the general lexicon um, negative language. But I also started to realize how black people, people of color, people that live on the edges or fringes of Western culture embrace how they're maligned or criminalized and, and often take back those words and use them in an empowering way. And so they use that language to talk about themselves um, in opposition you know, to Western life. So this quote is, since there's a good uh, and, and I can curse because you curse, right? So I'm good. <laughs> okay. There's a good we know. It, we know it's bullshit. Corny as Lawrence Welk on Venus. We will not be that hominy shit. <laughs> we will be definitely bad, bad as a motherfucker. So um, that's Amiri Baraka, and it's the intro to this book that I found um, at one of the subjects' house when we were filming, called um, "In Our Terribleness," and it's a photo book, and it's obviously about not terrible things, but about in our greatness, in our um, beautifulness. And in, in general society, the language around um, blackness and marked bodies in general has been about being 
ugly, our hair is wrong, our bodies are wrong, um, and certainly the, the chosen expressivity and lexicon is wrong, and grammar is bad, and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I love um, looking at and understanding how we have sort of like, you know, recaptured that and talked to ourselves and, and to the world about specificity and what makes us who we are. And I think as artists and creative and people who make things, I, I pose the question for this talk, you know, um, how do we, you know, should we be specific and will that still appeal to audiences and, you know, should we try? So spoiler alert, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think you should be as specific as possible. I think specificity is um, what makes everything great. And I think the question I always ask is, what do you lose by becoming less specific? What is it that um, you lose when you decide to become white as opposed to Irish? You know, what, what happened to people when they made those decisions? And then what happens to those of us who opt out and decide that it's much more important to be universal? And what is universality? Is it, is it even real? Um, these images, by the way, are Jamel Shabazz, 80s um, in New York. <clears throat> um, again, you know, sort of embracing and making meaning um, these, these images are zoot suits, which are pretty much the 40s equivalent of, um, what do you call it when you have your pants hanging down? What is it called? Sagging. Sagging. Um, and it's so funny because, it, you know, uh, context is everything for language, right? So they have on suits. I think if somebody was wearing a suit of any description at this point, most people would say, oh, that's, you know, appropriate. Um, but context is everything. At this point, wearing baggy pants and particularly wide lapels was really wild. And it's, this was especially made popular by Chicano second, second generation Mexicans in LA, but also, you know, across kind of rebellious culture. Um, so something else that's interesting about sort of specificity. Specificity to me necessarily means that it's something that's not accessible everywhere. It might be on the fringes. Um, and then it's something that sort of requires or uh, mainstream requires sanctioning for it to be okay, right? And once that sort of process of sanctioning happens, lots of people would say that's when it goes, that's when it's killed. And there was an article out that just came out this week, 15 slang words that black people invented that white people killed. I don't know if you guys read that. <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, I think middle-aged black lady is like, um, what they're also sort of coding and saying is white, because I was like, I think I killed that word too. Like, um, <laughs> fleek, I really love that word. <laughs> I was like, I see. But, um, but you know, the idea is that once somebody is, my, I have a middle schooler, so once I'm saying fleek, she's like, oh my God. <laughs> um, and so clearly, um, because mainstream and, and because, you know, in the context of these folks, um, you know, white patriarchy or unchecked capitalism, you can pick, pick your oppressor. Um, because those things exist, they almost are necessarily in conflict with expression, partly because um, those forms of expression are criminalized for a reason. It's not just because they are inherently criminal. It's also a way to control, it's also a way to malign, and it's the way that supremacy works, right? So um, it's interesting to me that a lot of, you know, sort of immigrants or people of color or um, particularly um, GLBTQ communities across the world are the sources of new language and new material, but also are maligned, and then once those things sort of become mainstream, they, they're, they're played back, as my friend says, play, their, your drums are played back to you. And so in this instance, at this time, you know, this is Easy Rider, you know, there were uh, lots of people of color that had motorcycle gangs, there were lots of um, sort of ways to express yourself as a rebel, and that sort of thing, and once it's in a film, it's official, it's sanctioned. You know, you're interesting, it's rebellious, they're handsome, everything is appropriate. You're, I've been inserted into it, so now it's okay. Um, but, you know, when you apply that language here, it's, it's criminal, it's inappropriate, it's ghetto, it's, it's all those sorts of things. Um, 
unless, like me, where you live in West Baltimore and you see the bravado and you, it brings you joy and you know that this is someone holding on to what bit of rebellion and expression they can have. And, um, and so, depending on your, you know, what language you use or what lexicon you dwell in, this is something that either brings you dread or intense joy. And, and for me, because I'm becoming an old lady, tears as well. <laughs> um, because again, if you go back to those posters, um, you know where this comes from. Um, it's something that's, you know, if you believe epigenics and all those sort of things are real, it's something that's sort of encoded um, culturally. Um, and language is also not just about literally words, but it's also about um, trying to access and, and represent your specificity in your work, in your, on your body, in the things you do, in the things you make. Um, and it's often something that, you know, again, with particular groups, um, it's something that is maligned. So if women do work that is telling a story that is specifically, very, very specific to our experience, or if someone is queer and they're able to tell something that a lot of people don't have access to, then you are sort of channeled, you know, you, you end up on the Lifetime Network or whatever happens to, to those groups. Or, you know, or more, more importantly, before your work is done, it's mitigated. Okay, oh God, oh, I'm not even close. Okay, sorry, all right. So, so that, that mitigation is, is also sort of violence to the creative process, right? So again, when people say, well, you know, don't you want to think about audience up front? I say no, I say make your work turn your back, make your work, have as, as, you know, the purest conversation you can have with your work before it's mitigated. And I believe that that's someone else's work to think about audience. Um, I won't go through these because it'll take forever, but, but also, um, you know, when I think about the work that I'm interested in and double entendres and coded language, it's something that is constantly evolving. And there was an article out recently that talked about um, English language could have gone the route of Latin had it not been for immigrants, people of color, um, you know, and they were particularly crediting hip hop culture for saving the language because it's dynamic, um, because it brings new, new information. And with each word, with each slang, when someone says, um, like my daughter says, uh, she is goals. She knows that the syntax is right. She knows exactly what she's doing when she says it, but it encompasses a whole phenomena to say someone is goals, right? When you do that, you create not just that language, but an entire set of, of um, gestures and ideas that go along with that language, and we expand our culture. Um, and so clearly, you know, hip hop has done that. Um, so that was something I wrote the day that I heard it. <laughs> um, you're welcome, English language. You got a couple more years as long as you, you're nice. Um, and so I, you know, and again, I was just trying to think of like the other part of it is that in often um, your specificity, whatever that is, um, is is sort of pushed down and discussed as a. Um, a nuisance, in a way, to things that are more appropriate and respectable. Um, as opposed to, you know, and I would say it's obviously not, but I would also go one step further and say that it's an enhancement. It's pithy, it's brief, it's, it's, it's clever, it's ironic, it's, it's all of those things. So that you don't have to write a paragraph that describes someone moving their eyes to the left, you can just say side eye, right? <laughs> you know what that means. And everybody knows now what side eye means. So when these things become absorbed, right? Not related to the election at all, I swear. <laughs> when these things become absorbed in our, our general lexicon, um, you know, some people say, oh, that, you know, you lose that specificity and, you know, um, things like jazz become, you know, sort of watered down. But you know, I would also say that this is, this is our role as artists. This is what we see. These are our specific lives, and we need to share them. And there, there's a fine line between appropriation and exchange. And so you know, I was going to try to talk about that a bit. And even exploring, this is an artist, Eben Heath, even exploring the idea of language as not even two-dimensional or, or, or static. 
I mean, language can be um, about just the letter forms. He's interested in letter forms in particular for the um, graphic design nerds here. Um, but it also can be something, you know, in and of itself. And so, you know, I'm interested in those things that live in the shadows and that operate in the shadows and then, you know, are expressed in sort of their like purest outlaw form. Um, <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> you know, I, I was having, my sister and I were talking about, you know, appropriation versus, you know, well, what about Tina Marie? I don't know if you guys know Tina Marie, but well, how come, she, you know, she's not an appropriator? How come this, you know, and what's authenticity and that sort of thing? And it's, and it's a, um, you know, it's a slippery slope and we go back and forth and I don't have the answers. I have a lot of questions, but, you know, one of my favorite people on earth, she is goals. Okay. <laughs> Iris Apfel is goals. And, um, or, and it's funny, uh, I watch this movie with my, with my tween and she says, oh, she is savage. Have you guys heard this? Speaking of language, have you guys heard that before? No. Nobody with tweens? And, okay, that's like the new way to say someone is really like fly, really amazing. And, um, and, I, and I, of course, my language, I was like, wow, you know, 400 years ago, savage would have been reserved for specific groups of people. Um, and, um, you know, it's ironic. We've taken that and we've made that into something that's really hip. Um, but, you know, she's a person who talks about growing up as a young Jewish girl in a city with access to international conversations and immigrant conversations and going up to Harlem and looking at women and seeing them wearing hats to church and being amazed and influenced and that sort of thing. And so she's, you know, she's a work of art. She is an artist. She's a person who's absorbed culture as well as given her culture to art and to, you know, mankind. And, and I would say that she's escaped um, you know, appropriation and that she has sort of elevated it to this cross-cultural phenomena and so where your specificity is shareable and, and, and it enhances, you know, the things around you and the people around you. Or someone like Ezra Jack Keats who is reflecting his culture. His culture in the, in the sense is um, children in uh, Brooklyn at that time, you know, and so yes, he's one of the first first authors to represent brown kids, ki um, black kids in uh, literature, <clears throat> in children's literature, but it's because he's representing what he knows, his world, his specificity. Um, and um, so who am I? <laughs> I am a, a partner in a company called Teaneg, and Teaneg is a film um, studio. My partners are Arthur J. Fa, who you may know from like Daughters of the Dust, and. Uh, Crooklyn and a bunch of other movies, and, and Malik Saeed. And we wrestle with this idea of what is a black cinema? What, are, what, is, what is the language of cinema? It's a new phenomena, you know, 100 years or whatever, in, in, as opposed to writing or singing or things like that, right? And it necessitates um, that you have proper equipment and money and things that are all, you know, barriers when you're trying to decide what, what a new art form looks like. And it also has less space for mistake and experimentation with regard to black people. So these are the kinds of things we wrestle with. And, and also that there are built-in um, barriers, like uh, what's, what, what was calibrated in terms of film, when people still use film, was not calibrated for dark skin. And so we play with these ideas around how do you subvert all of that? And, 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 and are we even making film? Like, does it have to move? You know, does it, can it be muted? Um, in this film, this is called Dreams Are Colder Than Death, a, a project that um, we shot for German television. And, and, you know, this film questions authority and, and expert, expertise by not having um, talking heads or synced sound or things like that. You know, playing with color and lighting or, or you know, the uses of imagery, so that we're trying to create a new lexicon and we're trying to work with other people in, in a technical sense, but also in terms of our narratives and um, the way we work together and the way we speak. And we look to pioneers like Charles Burnett, this is from uh, Killer Sheep, and we also look across disciplines because for us, representing that, that swag that, that they were trying to get on those posters, representing blackness, it's not how, what she sings, it's how she sings it, right, is what my partner always says. 
we, and, and AJ says all the time, we're always sort of wading through oil looking for gold. I mean, this is our oil, you know, this is our blackness and our, our specificity is our oil. And so how do you capture that and re-share that specificity in different medium? Um, intonation is a hard thing to get at. Is it, do you slow it down? Do you speed it up? Um, you know, how does, how does it work? I also am a curator. This is a piece that the incredible Brad Young did for a project I did called um, Black Radical in Brooklyn. And really quickly, this <clears throat> is a, a project that I curated called um, The Garden Party with uh, Riley Intergenoso and um, Sean Peters. And I looked at the way that this was at the site of the first free black community um, at the turn of the century in Brooklyn, 1827. And I looked at you know, the way that people celebrated and, and then tried to sort of bring underpinnings. And people would say, well, what does a black punk band from Kenya have to do with you know, the 18th century? And obviously, I was helping to try to build a, a lexicon around contemporized ideas around freedom. Um, not literal, necessarily, but sort of. And so you know, uh, um, challenging these ideas of binary gender and family and what it might have looked like then and what it, what it might look like now, um, <clears throat> you know, genre busting, um, celebration. Because in Brooklyn, there's a, there, emancipation happened in 1827, much earlier than the rest of the country. And uh, it happened on 4th of July. And there, because of reprisal and you know, debauchery, people couldn't celebrate it in front of people. And so they waited the next day and celebrated an emancipation day and did a cold water toast to celebrate having clean water which is particularly relevant right now. Um, so the water toast is what we would do. And you can see here, everybody at the garden party didn't have African ancestry, but this specificity and this meaning was made, oh, I'm finished, okay. So anyway, this meaning was made um, as a way to um, also talk about subverting the 4th of July celebration, which doesn't appeal to everyone. And, it does, and it's not just about people of color. Um, I also wrote a book called P is for Pussy, and it's a book of double entendres, which some people know about. Um, and someone, after the book was done, someone said to me, um, what if people don't know what an onion is? Um, you know, the double meaning of the onion. Each, each word has a double meaning, a naughty meaning, and then a, a, a sort of innocuous meaning that kids don't get. And, and I said, then, I, I don't really care. <laughs> and, and I don't, and not, not in a belligerent way, but I mean, I really, that's not, I don't think that audience belongs in the making process. And I know a lot of people disagree with that, but I don't know how to do anything otherwise. I think I would, I would go insane um, because I would be really scared to talk about ho um, in that space and start to think about you know, all my mother's feminist friends and everybody you know, who's raising me, I'd start to think, oh my god, is this going to work? And I don't think, I don't think that works. Um, and the same thing with, I think it would be constrictive um, for anybody who's, who's trying to create something at, you know, in the moment. Um, so my, I guess the question I would have for, for you as you sort of go out and try to make meaning is, you know, who are you, very specifically? You know, and I mean, not just regional, I mean very, very um, sort of drilled down. And what is your language and how do you make meaning? How do you make new meaning? And people say, you know, sort of do what you know, stick to what you know, and then it'll be great. And I would go further and say, stick to what you know and can express effectively. And, <clears throat> and I think that, you know, you do things like help save the English language. And uh, this quote here is, I'm a son of a blues player, who are you player? This is when Nas slayed, in my opinion, Jay-Z. Um, <laughs> and the <laughs> and reason why that's so important to me is that also confers identity. So when you're specific, your tribe comes out, the freak flags go up and you find each other. And it's also, it also serves this sort of collaborative piece. And what happens when you're limited by things like antiquated film or, or ideas around lighting, um, and because you're too dark, you make yourself darker, like Baron Claiborne did. Or even darker, like Andrew Dossima did. Or what if you have to play around with what is blackness? Um, or you know what? How do you represent um, something that's never been represented before? That's both feminine and not right, um, or pain or brokenness, right? And you know, 
I think words and language are, are critical in moving the culture forward. You know, I've never heard a presidential candidate call someone an idiot before. I'm not sure whether it's good or bad. I'm not really tied to respectability either, so whatever, but um, I've also never heard socialists. I've never, I've never heard candidates really say black, the word black in relation to people. Um, so finding that specificity to me is always where the pure expression happens. I'm, I'm, really, I'm sorry, I'm gonna wrap this up really quickly, but I was listening to NPR, I don't know if anybody heard her interview with uh, Terry Gross. This is uh, Brittany um, from um, Alabama Shakes. Talk about specificity, growing up in the woods, around boys in particular, um, biracial, in Alabama, I mean, all these things that you know, I don't necessarily need access to. And I didn't say earlier, but one of the things about appropriation or oppression is about people feeling they need to see themselves in it. I don't need to know her details. I don't need to speak all the languages to enjoy it. Um, and she said that, and Terry Gross asked her about size, which is really interesting, it's interesting. and she said, well, everybody looked like me. I mean, my mother and my family all looked like me. They were beautiful, so it didn't click. And, and we have this conversation all the time with my friends, like, when did you become black? It's like, you know, when the gaze happened. So one of the things we do in film is talk about taking that camera off and, and recording audio separate because that gaze kind of stands in to the white for the white gaze. And so what does that mean? And how can you, so this is again, how do you represent that intonation? You can do things like that. And she said, you know, once she finally did encounter really thin women, she said, okay, y'all do you, I'm gonna do me. And that was it. And I mean, that to me is, is specificity and you're back to the audience. Nina Simone from, a, from the stage saying, I don't know what y'all playing, but it's not what I'm singing. I mean, that, that is your back to the audience. You're, you're getting work done. You can worry about audience. I won't go into Walt Whitman's slang. If you can ever Google it, it's fantastic. Um, and, and essentially, I think in, when you talk about process, I think reach is a marketing term. That's for a group of people who take what you've created and what you're making and get it to the world. What I think of reach is, is have you made a heart connection with your tribe or one person or two people? And can you do it you know, with playing your back to the audience? And I would encourage people to do that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, being a speaker. Um, she was actually in New York, so um, she, she just hustles all the time. So <laughs> I'm really glad that you're here um, to give us your lovely talk. Um, we have some questions. Um, again, if you need to leave, please do so. It's OK. Um, I won't give you side eye. These are questions from, from people who are here? Yes. Those, but they're On in Twitter, the right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I just I want to make sure that I talk to people, the humans that are here before. Isn't that amazing how technology the, works? Okay, but but I'm saying those, it's here. Yeah. Those people are here. here. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> Sorry. Fairy godmother. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're gonna um, we're gonna do probably like maybe three questions. Um, probably one from the audience, but um, I definitely want to get some of these um, out. So one of them. Do 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 do. Actually, let's do our an audience question those. first. Yay. You can't see these. You, okay, I can't we, see you want to glass. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> does anyone have a question? A dying question in the audience? Did everyone use Twitter and is amazing? <laughs> but you're amazing if you want to speak here too. <laughs> no, I prefer to talk Lee? to you. Lee Heinemann, hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elisa. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So I don't, I don't know if you read this. I recently read an interview with the girl who first coined the word fleek. Yes. She's like a high school student. Yeah. And she said that she gave the, word, the world a word and has yet to receive anything back. And so I'm wondering oh. if you have an idea of what an adequate payment would be for giving the world the word fleek. It's immeasurable. It's somewhere up there with oy vey. Um, I, you know, it's funny, I was just talking about this as well because um, <clears throat> I, it, it depends. I think people's intention, right, that people calibrate their feelings about appropriation or whatever based on that, right? So I've heard, or I remember reading something in the New York Times with um, uh, not Chuck Berry, 
and he talked about how the Rolling Stones and Eric Clapton and everybody always said, he you know, him and black music unabashedly inspired us. We're not gonna pretend like that's not the case. They were very open and honest about it and gave a lot of deference. And he was like, yeah, that's great. Just write me a check, right? right? <laughs> and, and, but the thing is, is that there is no amount that's adequate um, for his imprint, right? And so this is why I think people get salty <laughs> because appropriation feels bad. It feels dirty that, that Miley Cyrus twerking thing felt mean and it felt um, without a source. You know, so once something is a word or an idea, you know, it has all of this other stuff. It has a whole people that go with it. And so I think it, it's, that's down to honest cultural exchange. That's really the payment. You know, if we're making work in a collaborative way and we're honoring and, and we're not feeling like we have to interject ourselves into cultures that are specific to someone else, we can just enjoy each other and um, appreciate it. I mean, one of my you know, favorite films and relatable films for some reason is like Frances Ha. And, and it's, I don't need to understand her experience. I mean, the love letter to New York part of it, I, I get. But um, there's a lot of you know, relatable pieces. I don't have to get all of them to enjoy it. That's sort of a, a I think it's a, 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 something that's sometimes part and parcel of domination or, or patriarchy or, you know, I don't know where it all comes from, but that not only do I need to know, but I also need to see myself or I need to um, co-opt it. So I think the more as society, as we sort of adapt things and have a sort of respectful collaboration, cultural collaboration, she won't, she won't feel that way. She'll know I'm part, I'm, my life matters. You know, and, and so I have, I have an abundance of things to give. I mean, that's sort of a place that, that Native Americans started. That's a place where we started. And, and it went horribly wrong. <laughs> and so that's a right that I think, um, you know, as cultural groups that are working together that we have to work on. I don't completely know, but, you know, not, I don't think it's literal money, though that doesn't hurt, um, but platforms and access and cultural capital you know, is important. I don't know. <laughs> Did I get to that? <laughs> no, I'm just going on. <laughs> and because you had such a great answer, uh -oh. we're going to stick to one I'm question. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. Um, no, but where where can people find your work? Find you online? So there's some in the back of the room. <laughs> for P is for Pussy, the book. What else? We're gonna we're gonna be on the other here? side um, with oh, the books. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but uh, online also. Yeah. Uh, um, social now media. Dot com has a couple of our films. We have something coming out. Yeah. In two months and uh, about two months. And then. And, um, do you know, I don't know social where media? Else. I don't know how. To, She's how on Instagram. I just um, got on. No, I'm not on that one. I just got on the yes, Twitter. Yes, you are. No, Sunny put me on it, but I don't know how to use it. Okay, but you are on it. Shh, don't I say don't that. Know. Okay, sorry, okay. I'm on um, she, she's she, she's I'm on, on Instagram. She's on Instagram. Hit, hit me on Instagram. Hit, yeah, hit her up on Instagram. That's how we. Hit me that, up, that's sorry. how we say it. Hit her up on Instagram. I'm goals. 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 I'm goals. Goals. Um, hit her up on Instagram at uh, E B Moorhead. There you go. Okay. Um, oh, the Twitter one I use Twitter. I'm better. I'm good, getting better. Good. Here's the Twitter one. What am I on Twitter? You're so young. <laughs> I love you. I love you. Um, this is so cute right now. Um, or come over to the next room. Yeah, come over to the next room. And humans. She loves human interaction. But as we love social media, too, she's also on Twitter at okay. Lisa Moorhead. She's on Facebook, too. Um, Peace for that Pussy has a page on Facebook. Um, and you can email her. Uh, you can contact you can her. Email Email me. You, okay, never, never email mind. That. You can't do that. Uh, <laughs> I have thirty thousand emails. Well, um, then I must be special. Um, so, um, but yeah, the, the the Twitter thing, I'm I'm behaving, and then the the um, <laughs> P is for pussy page is really good because somebody else. 
Somebody else is doing that. Um, <laughs> was I supposed to say that out loud? <laughs> I guess. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. I don't know we can admit. Calls. We can admit that. <laughs> um, and she's here. She's in Baltimore, and she's Very always about. So. so she loves your interactions, your face-to-face -face interactions. Um, again, um, peace for pussy. The books are out on sale out there, and she can sign them. Oh yeah, if you want me to. So um, <laughs> yeah, let's move over there. Thank you guys so much again for staying late. Thank, Thank you, you Elisa. Thank you. Sorry, I went over. <laughs>